Welcome to Breaking Banks. Welcome to Breaking Banks. I am your host, of course, Brett King, and uh, we are in our 10th year of uh, Breaking Banks. It's going to be 11 years soon. You know, it's coming pretty quickly. We are um, excited to have an author, um, a guest that's been on the show before, but uh, is back on the show. He's the author of a book called Attention Hacking, The Power of Social Media Selling in Insurance and Finance. Robin Kira, welcome back to Breaking Banks. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, where are you reaching us from today? Because uh, we are a global show. That's for sure. I'm, as you may have listened or hear from my accent, you know, uh, I'm from France. No kidding. I'm from Germany, <laughs> <laughs> Hamburg, Germany. Um, and uh, yeah, we are here. We live in Hamburg, Germany. And uh, yeah, we, we yeah. Sehr gut. So um, I've been doing research for my new book and, um, uh, you know, Germany just hit the 50% mark half the number of bank branches that they they have this year compared yep. with their peak which was back yep. in 2007 which was 40,000 so they're at 19,000 odd uh, branches now so this is a trend that we're seeing all across uh, Europe and across the developed world of course but um, it's in interesting to sort of look at how fintech particularly in respect to digital acquisition is really reshaping the way we think about banking you know um, all of these far rapidly growing banks like Revolut, um, you know, Monzo, Starling, you know, in Brazil, New Bank, uh, Chime in the US, WeBank in, in China and so forth, all built off this digital acquisition capability, as are these mobile wallets in the space. Yep. And so, um, you know, you, you talk a lot about uh, social media selling where does that come into the ability of these organizations to be so successful at digital onboarding compared with traditional players? Well, when a lot of players are going down the performance marketing route, amazing uh, search engine optimization, advertisement, and I think um, the challenger banks uh, and also some traditional banks who went down that road early, have shown us to how to win and excite customers, also have a great front end. Um, but I think if everybody does it at some point, it um, you don't have a competitive edge anymore or you're super great at it. But, you know, people are changing jobs. They are changing a performance marketing agency. So I think it's a little bit of a leveling field for everybody who is in there, if you look at different regions. And mm -hmm. uh, what we've seen, actually, that um, social media, um, if you go in the, the organic route or a little bit of pay too, but not in the performance marketing way, uh, actually is another way how to get attention. And you started uh, by saying that um, the regional branches, the local branches are dying away. And that's for sure. Um, but my book makes the point that when you're a salesperson um, and you build up a, uh, or even when you build up a uh, reach on social media, and it can be in your village, in your part of town, or as a mutual um, uh, local community bank. You actually can fight uh, the the trend because there always will people will be people that want to have a person to talk to or to yell at, um, and not to have the digital um, contact only. And you so, know, but I, but I, I mean. <sighs> I, you know, I'm I'm having this debate with my co-authors on the book, which you know my book's coming out called Branch Day Gone Tomorrow, right? And um, yeah. I've been having this debate with the co-authors who say, you know, often say this, but the reality is, you know, I do think there's a generational shift here. You know, I think like Ron Shevlin, who's a big commentator, as you know, in in the US, yeah. he just wrote a, a, a Forbes uh, you know article on this a few weeks ago, saying. Gen Gen Ys and sorry not yeah Gen Gen Zs in particular millennials to some extent but Gen Zs and alphas in particular they don't want to go to the branch this is a big change from if you look at other generations that people will often say the reason they choose a specific bank is there's a branch near their home or their office for exactly that issue if they have a problem they've got someone to yell at but increasingly I mean, the, the approach the digital, comp, digital players are taking is they're designing out those moments. They're designing yep. out the moments where you need to speak to a human. They're just, they're perfecting that service 
uh, aspect in terms of design and its alignment with customers' needs. And then if you look at Nubank, Nubank has the highest referral rate of any bank in Latin America, you know, and they're the fastest growing. They're the largest by number of customers as well. Um, so, you you know, this is because they don't have branches. And, yep. you know, if you, if you were to say that there is still, uh, you know, a component of that, I think what we're seeing is that, um, you know, if you are going to have branches in the future, the I think they have to be there to support digital. And I want to, yep. I don't want to take over your segment on this because I want to talk about the book more. Um, but I, I'm, I am curious as to why this sort of modality shift that now is becoming fairly clear around the world. This has happened in banking. You know, more yep. people now get a mobile wallet or sign up for a digital uh, only bank account than they do traditional plays. You know, 80% of uh, new bank account openings in the West now are, are, are done digitally, but that hasn't happened in the same way with insurance. Yep. You know, in insurance, uh, I, is, is it because insurers have not had that pressure um, from insure techs coming in and, and doing, you know, a lot more direct selling or is it the nature of the type of insurance sales that are happening? What do you think? Well, um, in the book goes about insurance and banks, but let's talk about insurance. So why has that not happened yet in, in insurance? I think there's three reasons. Um, number one is we have not seen InsurTech really eating away market share, as you have described in banking for new business or certain products line, for example, uh, new accounts. Um, we have not seen this in insurance happen, and we more have seen that InsurTech is actually pivoting away from being an attack an attacker to an enabler a lot of companies have you know built technology have not won a customer and now are providing this um technology actually to incumbents so that's one trend we've seen in insurance second it's i think it's a complexity of the products why I, I, to be don't get me wrong i think every insurance product can be sold online so it's not the the distribution uh, mm. that's complicated but it's how to build it regulatory requirements um, and people don't understand it right away if you're not a specialist to understand liability insurance to understand a household insurance uh, and i think it's super difficult to understand that um so what we have seen is and people are reluctant to change it um to to change it for certain product lines car insurance people change every year life insurance uh, long term long long term care insurance not so what i want to say is it's a complexity of the products that has mm. saved the insurance industry a little bit and also, it's a big pain to change uh, a policy. If you want to apply for a new health insurance um, or a supplementary health insurance, you need to, um, I don't know, open the last 10 years of your um, of your medical history. And you know, I right. can't remember when I was when yeah. I was in the hospital the last time. Was it before to the year 2000 or yeah. after? I exactly. don't know. And so I think that's also a big topic. So it's easier to change a bank account, have an automatic pull of all um, data from it. Um, but we have not seen that. And the third regulatory requirements, we have seen open banking, PC2, which has really pushed, I think, uh, um, um, open banking and all what this has to do with it. And we have not seen open insurance yet. So I think that's right. a little yeah. bit. Yeah, which, as you just pointed out, with medical data, for example, we need that sort of openness, you know, um, to be shared amongst, um, you know, insurers to be more competitive and things yeah. like that you know so i think um so i mean let's let's get back to the book um you talk about integrating social media into sort of the financial services framework we when we look at the biggest brands in financial services they still struggle with this they still struggle with social media um in terms of its its role I remember classically, I won't say which bank it was. I mean, if, if people that know me probably guess, but, um, you know, a, a global but um, based in, in uh, Europe um, bank. And um, I, I infamously in 2010 went to meet the head of marketing and the head of marketing, I asked them why they had banned Facebook in their premises. And, you know, the answer was, well, we ban all social media because we want to define the conversation about our brand. You know, we want to own that and we don't want, and I'm like, but so I just did a search on the brand name on um, Twitter at the time and showed him that the conversation is going on without you. 
you know, you need to uh, participate. This is the reason you need to participate. And if you're banning it internally for staff to use, then you've got no learning curve either, you know. So, um, so you know, it wasn't that long ago that social media was was really problematic for these brands. But who 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 was doing really well at this stuff? When you look at insurers and banks, um, there are there are few that do it really well. We just did a study on the largest banks in the world. Um, there are some that do a good, that do a do that do a decent job um, on LinkedIn. Some American banks, investment banks, uh, do a very good job uh, for their target group. So it's not going viral, having millions of mm -hmm. views. But if you look at you know what is their target group, they do actually a good job on it. Um, and you have some smaller and mid-sized companies that do a good job, but mostly driven by young or young-minded decision makers that um, it has nothing to do with age, has to do with mindset, um, that really say, oh, I really want to push this and understand what it actually means. Um, and But I see a shift. Um, I see a shift also because of people have actually working, have been working on the industry and said, guys, you really need to change something. And I see the change slowly actually arriving with a new generation of uh, decision makers. And we recently, I mean, we are don't I don't only write books in my free time, but I have a marketing agency in, in Germany. And what we do, what we just recently have a large pitch in actually providing digital service to a sales organization. Doesn't matter at this point, but what I want to say is the decision makers involved, the board, 50% young and young minded, they are on LinkedIn and others 50%, but making important decisions are not on the topic. And I think um and, and I think that has a big, big has been a big factor that decision makers do not. Uh, taste it themselves and so that's a that's a big point why it has not happened yet but to be quite honest um even the big insure tech and fintech mostly suck at social media mm. and content uh, marketing and um i don't know why but to be quite honest um yeah i, I don't know why yeah i mean i i can tell you back in the day you know when we were doing moving in 2013 and 2014 it was fairly easy to differentiate you know i remember yeah. just the fact that i would answer in like statements made by customers on social media i would answer them directly but and they were like different. yeah they were amazed you know now okay we didn't you know we had you know um 250,000 uh, or so customers at the time, right, in, yeah. in various guys. So it was manageable. I couldn't do it with 80 million, like Nubank, obviously. Um, but, you know, it, but but you're right. It's sort of about that culture. Um, do you think do you think there's sort of um, a cultural reckoning taking place where you have to have a certain level of competency on social media as a as one of these players now? Totally, because there are some that do a good job, like ING Bank does an amazing job. Uh, if you will look at banking here over here in Europe, you have some non-banking companies where you would not expect it from, like, I don't know, the German uh, the German ban, which is with the German train um, company government, oh, they do a great job. I think they have a great agency on their side. It's not us. Yeah, they have a great agency probably, or they're a very small team that's detached from the whole right. bureaucracy because they do really fun and crazy stuff. So shout out to them uh, or even government owned other companies do a great job, um, which is have a similar culture as, as banks have. And um, yeah. All right, cool. Well, um, the book is called Attention Hacking. So... Um, let's get specific, you know, give us some, give us some tricks of the trade, you know, give us some, um, strategic insight here, some, some, um, some techniques or tools that you recommend yeah. in the book that, um, should be the go-to, uh, you know, sort of stack for people trying to get this right. Okay. So of course there is a how to manual in the book, but you need to buy it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I can share it anyway. So what do you, I think it's not about the channel. It's not about, oh, you need to be good at LinkedIn. You need to be good at TikTok. It, it's about one thing. You need to be good at where your customer is. It sounds really crazy, but it, it applies to B2B salespeople, but it also applies to the um, branch manager. It applies to the insurance agent or in the marketing department. You need to be where the people are. And I think that in, in uh, search engine advertisement, actually the new challenger banks have done a greater job at actually attacking incumbents there and and are there in the social um in the in the in the search engines where the customers are 
um, you need to be there where the where the customer is, and um, that means don't fall in love with the with the channel. You know, we are super strong in TikTok. I think it will have a run for a few more years. But now, you know, Instagram Threads is coming up, and you have some other social media platforms that are new. So always try out the new stuff, um, and when you see that it's going, that's viral, Gary V's thing, right? Gary V's always like you should be experimenting with this stuff. Yeah, know? but. It's very important also as a decision maker to do it and I agree there with Gary. You need to experiment with it. Not that you need to become the most, um, the best expert on that. But why is it important that you experiment with it? Because you can make a profound decision. Is it really going hot or not? Because agencies and internal experts are standing line uh, in, in your front office as a decision maker and try to sell you something, you know, but if you can say, oh, no. For example, we are tr tr testing Twitter um, uh, back and forth in case uh, Elon Musk does some do some great move there, and we are there, but we don't see it or feel it. So we can go to our clients and say, you know, Twitter for you does not make sense at this point. For a lot right. of company, it does. But for some com companies, it doesn't. Or it's not a positive surprise. But you know, Instagram threads, for example, is something just recently released a few days ago here in Germany. Um, it, it can be a viable move or WhatsApp channel. So we, it's all of us tried out. And um, as a decision maker, you need to do it in order to really make a profound decision. But when you have made one, then you can pass it on to internal or external experts. Um, why? Because you don't want to be a typical insurer. Um, I can ask you a quick question, but when do you think the last German insurer proudly announced that he is also now now on Facebook? When did that happen? Oh, probably three months ago. Yeah, last year. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. but I mean, think about it. What I know. culturally in the whole organization. And it makes a press world, release. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> and nobody says, screen stop. Crazy. The emperor has no clothes on. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think it's a disaster. And it um it says a lot. And you so you need an organization actually, where I have another example. I have another example, for example, a small insurer in Germany, classical car insurer called OCC. They build up this internal and external competency. And when Clubhouse came along, these two days it was popular, they were on it. So it was really interesting to see that suddenly they could react. It didn't work out, but hey, they're now the biggest TikTok channel. A few months later, they went on TikTok full scale. So I think that shows you can win a lot um, with uh, with being early and, 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 and going mm. on. But again, if you're a large organization, uh, as a decision maker, try it out yourself in order to make a profound decision, and then you can pass it on. And to be quite honest, we're talking about non-existing budgets. Um, and even as a multi-billion dollar yeah, bank. It's, or, it's or, still the uh, same problem in digital generally, right? There's lack of budget. No, I would yeah, say. Com comparative would say, to geez, other parts of the business. I mean, close a branch and you can become market leader on social media. I know. That's that's it, right? I mean, it's that that's the that's the economics how the economics look it's so incredibly uh, you know swayed um you you've mentioned tiktok a few times robin so um that it, it appears to me and certainly for the team at breaking banks that right now today and and for me as a keynote speaker by far the most effective form of social media is short form video like it's performing yep. five ten x better than anything else that we post right now um, and I know this is time sensitive and it's likely to change in the future, but, um, you know, what are some, what are some good short form approaches you've seen? So, um, on TikTok, uh, we have a B2C channel where like, over half a million people are following us and we have up to 20 million views each month. So just to have a dimension and we produce between five and 10,000 short videos each year for us and our clients. So what is the secret? The secret is really have a look at current popular uh, formats. Um, as a keynote speaker, take the high notes, the high points of your keynote uh, out, uh, do like a 10 to 25 second video or one minute, one minute, 30 video out of it. But you, what you don't want to do is take your YouTube uh, video, uh, image video nobody looked at and put that into nine to 60 format and put it on TikTok. There you will fail miserably. Um, and it's really, you need to, yeah, it, I mean, you know, banks and insurers to do it yeah. and then say, oh, you see, social media doesn't work. The image video, nobody yeah. watched it already uh, is, is not going viral. Um, and um, what I think one thing that changed really over the last 18 months is before 18 months, you and your, I don't know, uh, a, a teenager in his room could uh, become in TikTok famous. This times is over because you have a lot of professionals right now there. So what my biggest uh, uh, tick uh, or a tip there is, 
uh, you need to get some professional help, internal or external, to uh, to do that because the algorithms are brutal. Um, what do you and you know you need to start with a good hook, with a good start, with a good joke, and then explain something. Um, so my big tip is look at successful creators, copy them, not copy, but you know be inspired and rebuild it. Mm. Look how they structure it, and then try it out. Um, and um, and I think uh, that that's the biggest biggest tip there. And yeah, the, you know there was right? a trend for a while that the like the the uh, world economic forum videos they were yeah. a template for people to do you know with, yeah. with some you know b-roll and some images and some text overlaid and things like that but uh yeah now the short form stuff is is really interesting you know in terms of um it is we are learning to consume content in much shorter sound bites you know and shorter um form it's like um, I'll be sitting there watching TV on my TV sometimes and I'll be flicking between Netflix. I'll start watching a Netflix show and I flick to something else and then I flick to YouTube. Um, and, you know, it takes discipline now to sit and watch an hour long or an hour and a half long, um, you know, movie or something yeah. because we've just got so used to this highly consumable content. So it's, you know, it must have some sort of cultural impact. Yeah, you know, totally. and that's part of the drive. Right? It's showing that the attention span goes down. And when you produce yeah. a video or a post or a book where the point is made only after 100 pages or after 100 seconds, the people scroll. It's ruthless. Yeah, exactly. But isn't it also democratizing that, you know, people are not being forced by a few editors to read not good <laughs> content, yeah. but actually they can or, or being books. subjected to these TV commercials just yeah. to watch your favorite TV show. Yeah, exactly. We are yeah, really famous for for being anti-commercial. Why? Uh, not because we're not like in capitalism, but because I cannot stand bad bad movies and, and commercials are actually bad movies. Uh, pushing down this push, being pushed down the throat of the consumers by ad, and you know, actually, you know, you're getting uh, chained through your sofa, and you need to watch this horrible message. So um, I'm, I'm you've got to come to Thailand, dude. You know, Thailand the the ads are hilarious in Thailand. They're, they're yeah. funny as, but anyway, which, which is, is part of what you're talking about. So another aspect of this, because I want to get to this before we, we finish up is the ethical and regulatory yeah. approach to this, you know, obviously with uh, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and, you know, even what's been happening with Elon lately on X, there's a lot of questions about the ethical standards behind this. So, um, but you know, off, you often also see that re, these really aggressive marketing techniques, particularly for things like mobile gaming and stuff like that, they are, they do have a measure of success. You know, TikTok itself, in terms of its growth, came from some pretty clever marketing. You could you could argue. Um, so, where do you sit in terms of where you think that those sort of ethical standards are going to go for this space? Well, I'm old school, you know, uh, you have in, in Central Europe also a whole community of coaches and consultants and rip-off artists and scam artists. Uh, I always urge uh, companies, banks and insurers to play a long game, but the funny thing is most of them do, yeah, so, um, so uh, my argument is... Um, um, it's a little bit like when you get rich. When you get rich, you reveal your true character. It's the same when you have a powerful tool as social media, you reveal your true character. And as a company or individual, I only can urge people to be the nice person you are also to your neighbor in the street. Um, so I think also I don't condemn platforms because they just um, multiply the effect and the kindness or the opposite of of the people so our philosophy or my philosophy is also um i didn't write it actually explicitly in the book i may do it for the next <laughs> for the next one to say you need to be kind and nice and honest and old school um yeah. and i think there is a new way of old school um uh, there uh, in a way in in the world that's super fast changing um in the one 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 funny thing i'm not sure how you feel about it but Yes, I see a lot of uh, digital business and there's e-commerce, there are online uh, platforms, online accounts. I totally get this, that a lot of business is still being done between humans, especially in the B2B space. So I strongly um, believe also still in the, in the human touch and in the long game. Yeah. Well, I do think, um, I do think there's going to be sort of a reckoning for the corporate yeah. world. 
in that, you know, as, as climate change and AI technology based on employment and so forth, as this kicks in, if you really don't have your, you know, I's dotted and your T's crossed in terms of your social responsibility, then, you know, you're going to be seen as a bad actor, you know? Yeah. Um, so I do think that there's going to have to be a fairly significant change to the way corporations are integrated into the world, into society in terms of benefit. I think that that's a cultural shift that's probably likely to occur. Not everyone agrees with me on that. Some think the corpos will take over, you know, like the cyberpunk world. But anyway, look, I, I, we've run out of time, um, Doc, but um, uh, I will uh, just ask you to uh, um, tell us, uh, you know, first of all, for those that are listening, the book is Attention Hacking, The Power of Social Media Selling in Insurance and Finance. Um, but Robin, where, where can people find out more information about the book and about yourself if they're interested in this topic? And, and so they're interested they in the topic. watch you. Um, so, yeah, watch me. Don't go on TikTok because it's crazy. Yeah? Uh, and it's a B2C channel and thank God it's in German. Um, the book you can actually find on Amazon and uh, it's not a, you know, we, we don't make a lot of money from it. So it's really about spreading the word to uh, salespeople around the world, how to use it and, and people in marketing and insurance and banks. Um, if you want to contact me, uh, drop me a note on LinkedIn uh, or go to our homepage, digitalscouting.de uh, or say hi at one of the next conferences I might attend. I'm looking forward to you and, you know, giving you a high five and maybe if COVID is finally over, also a hug. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Would be great, dude. Um, I don't know when I'll next be in Hamburg, but um, you know, I do get to Germany now and again. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Very good to see you. Thanks for dropping by. Thank you very much for your time and giving me the opportunity. This show is brought to you by Alloy Labs. As much as we love talking on the show, we believe that action is more valuable than talk. Alloy Labs is the industry leader in helping fearless bankers drive exponential growth through collaboration, exclusive partnerships, and powerful network effects that give them an unfair advantage. Learn more at AlloyLabs.com. Alloy Labs. Banking Unbound. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.